hey, yes. let's cut this out until we get to, <laughs> till we get going. Papa's guy. Uh, so I think yeah, the only sorry. thing we're going to be able to do on here is say what we see here and say, guys, yeah. this is based on this video. If we go any further, you know, we've heard a lot of this and a lot of that, but we're looking at the first video because we think that's their best chance of us identifying whether they're truthful or not. Is How, just as a, for my, my understanding, this video that we watched, how long after the three weeks, three weeks, I thought so. I thought it was three first weeks. interview. Yeah. And it, it's less than three weeks. I think I want to say it's a 26. Right. So it's the first interview they've done after appearing in front of cameras at the time and, and that yep. um, circus. All right, let's see. So guys, uh, I think it's fair to poke on this and beat it up. If we see something that doesn't look good, that's cool. one. I, I think we should be aggressive as we can, but use facts. All right, so you guys ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a, uh, an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, here we go. I'm Scott Rouse. I'm a body language expert and analyst. I train law enforcement and military in interrogation and body language. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language. I help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, and gain credibility every time they communicate. Chase? Hey, I'm Chase Hughes. I did 20 years in the U.S. military. Now I teach psychological operations, psychological warfare, persuasion, influence, and behavior profiling, and I'm a trial consultant here in the U.S. Greg? I'm Greg Hartley. I spent most of 20 years in the Army. I was an interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written a few books on body language and behavior, and I spend most of my time in, on Wall Street and in corporate America. Excellent. Well, we're going to talk about Madeline McCann and her parents and Madeline McCann's disappearance. And uh, we've, we've watched a lot of videos, and this is the one we think is the best one to go over. Greg, you want to talk about why it's, we think it's the best one? Yeah, and guys, I just arbitrarily chose the first. This is three weeks after the disappearance. And I figure if you're going to get truthfulness or the opportunity for truthfulness before they've had a lot of time to think and go and stew and do that, this is probably our best opportunity. There are many, many other videos. And I'm sure everybody wants us to watch some of those others maybe another time. But this is the first time they're in front of an interviewer. And these questions are pretty pointed. All right. All right. Well, let's uh, get right to it then. We'll start uh, with question one. Tell us how you discovered that Madeline had gone. Um, as I think people are aware, um, we were checking regularly on the children. And um, it was during my, one of my checks that I discovered she'd gone. I, mean, I can't really go into any details about that, but I'm sure any parent will realise how that felt. Did the panic set in immediately? Yeah, pretty much. All right. Well, here, the first thing I'm seeing is the dad taking that heavy sigh as soon as he asked that question. And I think what we're seeing there is it's almost like, okay, here we go. He's done it quite a few times at this point. We're three weeks in after, the, after she's been missing. And so you see that big heavy sigh because he, they've been thinking about this all day and probably the day or two before because to set the interview up. And finally it's here and here, here we go. So it's almost like a, all right, here we go. When you get to the top of the roller coaster, all right, here it comes. And then when the mom starts talking, her, her voice is quiet. It's almost brittle as she goes along. Because I think what we're seeing here, as we'll, we'll address in a few minutes, we're seeing profound and overwhelming guilt and sadness right here over, over, over what's happened. And her answer is rehearsed, but it's not, but it's rehearsed in the sense that she's told it so many times up to this point. She's just going through it one more time. And the, the interviewer isn't very aggressive, which is good in this case. Um, and so that's why I think she feels comfortable in just kind of letting it come out like that. So we see what I term as the, the loping part, but it's, it's the stops we're seeing in it are the emotional things she's trying, I think, to hold back as, we, as she goes through that. When she's shaking her head yes at him when he asked, when, when she's saying uh, there are parts of this, in other words, I can't tell you, she's assuring him she's not going to go into details. Because sometimes, as we know, the police say, hey, don't talk about this because we need, we're going to hold that evidence back for whatever of the many and various and myriad of reasons. Um, and then when he says, did panic set in, you know, immediately, she says, she almost whispers, yeah, and uh, pretty much because she's, she's wiped out, you know, she's, as, as it comes out, yeah, pretty much because she's just trying to get through it. Obviously, that's going to sit, that's the most horrific moment of her life that he's asking her about right then, right out of the gate. So I think that's what we're seeing there. Also, as we go through this, there are no, 
We don't see any barriers whatsoever. There are no, the illustrators are minimal, if any at all. I think the dad does a couple. And we see the mom filling with that little doll she's got there, using that as an adapter, but that's normal because it belonged to the little child, to, to Madeline. Um, but I think we're seeing with, with their demeanor and the, the movement that we're not seeing is due to that profound sadness that, that, that they're dealing with right now. Um, so this is this uh, breakdown is going to look to mo to the uh, uninitiated in this world. It's going to look odd, but when you see someone suffering from this, it's quite normal. You know, it, it's it's almost what you see every time when someone is going through something that again they use the word profound. Greg, yeah. So guys, I'm going to tell you something about my life. Um, I lost my only child, and there is no way for you to put into words how that feels. And after three weeks, you may think someone says, hey, I'm emotional or I'm emotionless. It's not emotionless. There is no ability to have emotion after three weeks of what you go through. I can tell you that at the end of three weeks, both my wife and I would look at each other and just, we're not the same people. We had no feelings at all. So for them not to be what you think of as an emotional person during this is not abnormal. It's like being an empty glass at that point. A couple of things to notice with her. Her cadence has dropped to about if we normally speak at about, you know, let's make up a number and say 60 words a minute, not that fast, or fit, take 60 as a beat, a cadence, hers is about 40. She slowed really down. That's, she's gone. There's not animation in her. This is an intelligent, educated woman, and there's not animation in her speech, nothing flowery in her speech. The adapting is more comforting in this case, especially she's gripping this baby doll that's her, her child, the physical manifestation of what was her child. She's talking about the worst moment of her life. If you notice her eyes, and I'm the eye movement guy, you guys all know, she has left the conversation in terms of eye contact, and it's all internal conversation and emotion, all down left, down right, down left, down right, down left, down right. This is appropriate for somebody who's in this situation. And when Duchesne talked grief muscle, this muscle here, anyone who has gone through a tremendous amount of people in grief will have that curved hard for me even to do it, but it comes naturally when you're dealing with grief. So pay attention to her, pay attention to where she's going here and realize this is like being a piece of cloth. All of her emotions are gone. It's not that she's sad or happy or anything. They're just gone. Yeah. After I remember you know, not, not too long after that, you could do the grief muscle. Cause I said, I rarely see somebody can do it. And you're like, I got it. And bang, it was right there. I was like, Holy yeah. smokes. Almost it was bizarre. Cause it's so hard to do. If you're not experiencing that, well, obviously you were. Yep. So that was um, something you could do on demand, which was mind blowing. You know, Mark, what do you got? Yeah. So watch that stillness. Very quiet. Very still. This is not something I would expect from people under stress around answering these questions. So there's a great stillness to them, a great reserve to them. Watch out for those downcast eyes. In the, in the father, it'd be easy, I think, to go, well, is that eye blocking because of deceit? Uh, it's shame. It's uh, it, it, potentially grief, I think more likely a sense of, of shame simply because uh, it, it, he names it. He names the emotion later on, so he, he tells us what it is. Um, notice when the interviewer talks to her about panic, watch this part of her body, and you'll see the chest rise quickly, and you see her relive through her breathing that injection of panic. That tells me that somebody is reliving a real emotion that they had. It would be very difficult to create that on command. So, you know, I concur with what you guys are saying so far, which is uh, this feels uh, very real grief to me. Uh, Chase. Chase. I agree. And at the beginning here, we see uh, Jerry's leg uh, has his hand, his hands resting on his leg and it's in a certain spot. And just one thing to take note of here as the question's being asked, we're not seeing any digital flexion. And even those tiny little retreat of the fingers curling back in the palm is a big deal. And we don't see any of that. And this is going to come up later, or I'll bring it up later towards the end of the interview. This is something just to take note of. And I noticed one thing 
that you'll see with anybody who's been convicted of murdering somebody, but they did a TV interview to say they were innocent first. Neither one of these people made a deliberate attempt to show suffering or grief. So both of them had had no deliberate attempt to do that, which I thought was in, interesting. And they both, as the question was being asked, had a downward emotional gaze. Both of them did. And we also noticed that Kate socializes the issue. She says, everybody says this, and you know, as anybody would understand, as everybody had probably has already heard. So we're going to hear a lot of socializing and use of something called social proof which we'll come back to a couple of times here. And there's a, they're both breathing into their, their chest, which is indicative of stress. If you meet somebody with social anxiety, you'll see the chest go up and down. And if you see someone who's relaxed, it's typically the abdomen that goes in and out. If you watch a person sleeping, for example, the abdomen rises and falls instead of the chest. And that's, that's good. I mean, that's, that's a truthful thing that's expected for a scenario like this. So that's what I got out of the first, first question. Excellent. Anybody want to add anything? The only thing I would add at the end of this is both of these people are doctors. They're accustomed to thinking about other people and talking to other people in a way that's meaningful and engaging other people you can guarantee. There's not a lot of engagement here with her. Okay. All right. Tell us how you discovered that Madeline had gone. Um, as I think people are aware, um, we were checking regularly on the children. And um, it was during my, one of my checks that I discovered she'd gone. I, mean, I can't really go into any details about that, but I'm sure any parent will realise how that felt. Did the panic set in immediately? Yeah, pretty much. Let's move to the next one. This is a resort that offers childcare facilities, baby sitting facilities. Why then were the three young children left alone in the apartment while you were having a meal? I mean, I think if you know the location here, which you've seen, uh, what we did, uh, I think, and it, we've been reassured by the fact in the thousands of messages from people who have either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. And for us, it, really wasn't very much different to having dinner in your garden and the proximity of the location. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the guilt that we feel having not been there at that moment, irrespective of whether we had been in the other bedroom or not, will never leave us. All right. We at the top here, we're seeing um, his voice is calm. As it, as it has been every time he's, he's, he uh, says anything. Be, the reason being, he is a doctor, as we talked about before. He's a cardiologist, and he's a guy that knows how to, has to give people bad news quite often. And, he, and his answers are, and his sentence structure, the structure of his answer is concise, and it contains all the information that you're going to need for um, giving someone bad information he's used to doing that so he's, he's he can get in there for this answer and give a concise tight answer that covers everything and still keep his himself together emotionally which is really tough at that point he doesn't really hit any word again we see um something that's indicative in someone who's just completely wiped out emotionally they're just he's just just talking that's really the only word he hits as um hits really hard is is the word never so that's really all, all I've got on that is just his, he's, he's delivering this in a structured manner because that's what he's used to doing. That's, and his sentence structure, again, is just great because he's so smart and knows how to do that. So he gets all the information in there. Not that he's been rehearsing this answer because he doesn't have, he's not saying, here's what happened. It went like this, this, and this. He's just saying what happened as he, like you would explain to someone they have a, a serious health situation on their hands. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, not much here. Uh, at the beginning, Kate hears Jerry uh, start to answer. She opens her mouth to answer, shuts her mouth, and then kind of looks away. I think there's some shame here. I think that that could be an indication. I would initially think that there are some marriage problems going on now, that they're starting to have problems in the marriage. And not that, not that this makes them bad people. It makes them human. And I think that that's they're kind of suffering some problems in their marriage, which Kate has talked about. But I would, 
initially think that that might be the case and ask some different questions, but obviously we can't. And Jerry answers immediately with an eyebrow flash, which is very genuine, uh, unrehearsed eyebrow flash, which is uh, what, you know, primates and humans, we all squeeze our eyebrows down and together when we're, we're PO'd, we're, we're mad at somebody. And the eyebrow flash is something we do to indicate innocence. It's the opposite of anger to other primates. So we see him do this automatically at the beginning. And we also hear him, just like Kate did, socializes the issue using social proof. We've got thousands of messages from thousands of people saying that they would have done the exact same thing. So he's socializing the issue to make it okay. Again, doesn't make him guilty. Okay. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, so I would agree, Chase. We're, we're seeing this idea of them setting up uh, a narrative here that they haven't mistreated, they haven't been abusive. Uh, leaving three kids in a room on their own is something that any parent would have done, it's just like, you know, being in your own garden. Uh, and, and so, because there, I would believe, and, and what I'm seeing is there's huge guilt uh, and and shame around this. And I think that the, the father uses the word guilt there. So he names the feeling quite clearly there. Uh, when the interviewer says three young girls left alone, three young girls left alone, we see a slow uh, blink from um, uh, uh, the woman. And that for me would signal her unconscious agreement with that. That would suggest to me that in her mind, it is true. There were three girls left alone in the room. This for me starts to discount some ideas that something else might have been going on. There weren't three, they weren't left, you know, there was something else going on at the time that the idea of leaving them alone was not true. There's unconscious agreement there that three young girls were left alone in the room. I'll leave it there, Greg. Yeah, a couple of things. When he starts the question, she does start to answer, and you can see she's relieved she doesn't have to answer that question. Her eyes trail down left. That's internal conversation. And you're probably right, Chase. This creates tension between a couple. No matter how good the couple is, this creates tension. It's going to. And some people don't make it through it. It is a number one outcome of someone losing a child is they often split. A lot of couples do. So <clears throat> there's probably some tension there, but you can see her eyes drift down left and probably thinking, what's the next question? There's not emotion in that. It's a breakaway, it's to get away from it, and then he starts to answer. I'll also say now, Mark, you'll be able to speak back to this, but if you're looking for a guy with a cheerful kind of persona, this is a Glasgow kind of a guy, you're probably not gonna get the quite the dialect you're looking for from Mark that sounds much more cheerful. That kind of a Glasgow accent's kind of hard. And if you're an outside that world person and you're talking to a cardiologist who's matter of fact, by the way, his chin is up. We know that when people confess to crimes, their chin goes down. They protect their throat. So he is not in a pre-confession state or anything like it. He is. What we should do for you guys is point out the things they're not doing that liars do. And liars, a person who's guilty covers their throat. A person who's guilty breaks eye contact and changes words. It's easy to mistake that any normal person would have done this as blame sharing. I don't think that's the case here. I think they're simply saying, look, we could see the door from where we were and we thought, okay, this is okay. They certainly feel some guilt because yeah, they were checking on them every 30 minutes. They knew it, there's a risk of some kind and it makes people really doubt them because of that. And I'm sure they have a million times since this thing happened, gone over it in their head and said, why did we do that? Why did we do that? Why did we do that? We'll never know all the, all the facts, but I think you can see that she breaks eye contact and she's very stern and concerned at that moment. And then he steps right in. I would guess that they have talked about who takes the hard questions of which kind, not because they're trying to lie, but because the last thing she wants to do is fold on TV and just come apart. That's couples, even if they're not happy. Okay, Greg, just very quickly, because you said people will break eye contact and then change what they're talking about. They'll change the subject, they'll change as they deflect. Or, so most people are under the impression that breaking eye, eye contact means you're lying. So will you go into a little bit of detail about that? Yeah, so everyone listening, I'm going to play eye movement for three minutes with you and just give you a feel for this. Wherever you are in the world, I'm not gonna try a national anthem story because we got lots of people all over the world listening to this. So let's try something different. 
think of your favorite song in the entire world right now and just think of the first few words that come to mind. Ding, 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 ding. See your eyes moving around in your head and you'll get to a baseline where you're going somewhere to retrieve information. Now I'm going to ask you another question. Describe the first pet you ever had. Think about that pet for a minute. And your eyes are going to go somewhere else because you're looking for visual cue or maybe even an emotional tie. When I ask you a question that requires you to think and your eyes break contact, it doesn't mean you're lying. It means I'm forcing you to think. If your mother's 90 and I say, what color is your mother's hair? And you say gray, that doesn't take thought. So the question needs to ask something that creates thought. We could probably say stairwell to heaven. What's the ninth word? Everybody on earth has heard that song. If you play it through your head, you'll likely your eyes will drift slightly up and somewhere to your left. Most of us about 10% will go the other place. So I want you to know that eye movement will probably do something on this at one point is normal for people who are thinking. When you get to these two lower levels, that's all internal conversation, whether it's emotional or navigating thought. Great. And let me add something onto that, Greg. It's brilliant that you, you brought that up. The myth that people look away when they're lying, where people say, oh, yeah. look, me in the, look me in the eye and, and tell, me, tell me that again. That myth is so pervasive that liars are more likely to make direct eye contact uh, when they're being deceptive. Well, and I'll take that a step further. I call that glossy. It means they're so focused on you, they want to make sure that you believe them that they're not going to break eye contact. Most people I've ever interrogated who are guilty are doing this the whole time, paying really close okay. attention to me. That's because that myth is so predominant. Everyone yes. thinks that. And one of the main reasons that I think that people keep that they don't break eye contact, the liar, even if they don't realize they're trying to keep looking because they know you think they're going to break eye contact, is because they want to make sure you believe them. Yep. So if you, if you start giving it one of these, they're going to start adding these qualifiers to it to make their story more believable. Yep. And when, if you question or if you pause and wait, which is the classic. So, all right, good? Yeah, I think this is important to say what they're not doing. Mark, it yeah. was your idea originally. I think it's a great one. Yep. Yeah, excellent. This is a resort that offers childcare facilities, babysitting facilities. Why then were the three young children left alone in the apartment while you were having a meal? I mean, I think if you know the location here, which you've seen, uh, what we did, uh, I think, and then we've been reassured by the fact in the thousands of messages from people who have either done exactly the same or said they would have done the same. And for us, it, really wasn't very much different to having dinner in your garden and the proximity of the location. I think it's fair to say that, you know, the guilt that we feel having not been there at that moment, irrespective of whether we had been in the other bedroom or not, will never leave us. All right, let's move on. Do you blame yourselves regularly? Certainly the first few days, I think the guilt it was it was very difficult, um, but I think as time goes on, um, we feel stronger, and we felt very supported from that point of view. All right, Mark, you want to go first? Yeah, just just hear all the downward inflection in that. So downward inflection, you know, there may be around about three reasons for it. Either it's because of depression. It's that sense of this is over, this is done. Either it's because of affirmation, this is certain. And sometimes when loud, it's very clear affirmation, it's, it's command. And if somebody were making something up and trying to check in with you to see whether you were buying this, I would suspect that you'd be getting a lot more upward inflection, especially on statements. Uh, and, and, and even if you've got, you know, maybe, maybe somebody with an Australian accent where it does go up a little bit at the end of each line, you'd still get more upward inflection in that. So you can tell, still tell, even with accents, when people are being affirmative and clear and when they're asking for approval. This is all very affirmative and very, very clear. So again, I, I'm feeling like there's a great deal of, of certainly emotional honesty around all of this. I totally agree with you. And what we're seeing, I think, when, the, when he first asked the question, and we see the dad, his eyes start darting around and then he closes them for a while. We're seeing eye blocking there because of the, the question. Because again, it's a heavy, you know, we're talking about blame. That's what their whole world is, is teetering on, is, is at that pinpoint of blame right there and guilt. 
So I believe that's what that's what we're seeing there, and that's so that's why his eyes do that. The the mom she she nods yes almost the entire time she's answering. So do you blame? Do you feel blame when you're doing that? She's everything she's saying. She's shaking her head yes. She's nodding yes that she feels blame. So that tells me that yeah she's that that is foremost in her mind as it is his obviously. But that's what that's what cues me in on that. And the eye blocking we see that in her as well at the beginning of that question. And again, it's like being somebody blowing in your face or throwing something at you. You start doing this and they keep them closed for a, a couple of minutes. I think Chase refers to that as the shutter speed slows way down on that. Their eyes stay closed a little bit longer. So Chase, what do you think? So in this, we have, uh, she answers the question and Jerry doesn't makes no confirmation glance at all. So there's a question asked. And if we're both sitting here, and I'm not sure who's going to answer first. I'm going to maybe just glance or check in to see if she's going to answer. So I think they have said, like, if, you know, if we ask a question or we'll take turns. or So something has been set up. Uh, so they're both still chest breathing. So that's just to tell you that we're, we're kind of monitoring this baseline as the interview progresses so that we're seeing the similar behavior here. And we're also seeing a repetitive use of what I call team pronouns. A person can either use self, team, or others pronouns, according to Chase Hughes. And, and I would listen to that throughout the interview. And if those pronouns change, that's a big deal. But if I'm trying to get someone to confess, I don't put it if they've been using team pronouns, we, us, our, the whole time. And then I pitch like, oh, you need to confess to this. This is going to benefit you. And I start using self pronouns to a person who's focused on teams the whole time. Then I make a big mistake. So I need to use the same words that they do in my questioning and all of, all of this, something I teach in interrogation, just a quick tip for you guys. And when she says the words, we feel stronger, you see a little bit of a, a shoulder shrug. I definitely don't think they feel stronger at all. I don't think she has much confidence in that statement. And you see her head withdraw right when she says from that point of view. So right here, she's saying point of view. And in the, in the next question, what we're going to see is, is her husband, Jerry, start using very, she says point of view, and Jerry's going to start using a lot of visual words. And for the rest of the interview, everything's going to be listed mostly, I'm sorry, most everything is going to be listed as visual words. So right there, that's she's saying stronger and supported. So those are her key words. And if I was trying to get her confessed at the end of this, I would use those two words because those are very important words. Her adjectives and the way she describes things are very important. At the end of our little interview, I'm going to use her team-focused pronouns. I'm going to say us, our, we, everybody, your family, your friends. I'm going to talk about teams. I'm going to say, I think this is a way that you become stronger. And I think there's no way that you're not going to be supported if you make this decision. So I'm going to use her words that she's used. Just a, just a couple of tips there. I went on a little long. Sorry, guys. No, Chase, your Kung Fu is good. <laughs> I'm not going to leave that in. <laughs> All right. So, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so a couple of things. I'm going to steal a little bit of, of what you started down the path with there, Chase, as well. Remember, I work in business in corporate America. Really good leaders say we, not I. And the guys that always jump on the I once things go well and the we when shit hits a fan, those are the guys you really don't want on your team. So that's a really good indicator of how people's psyches work in that. There's a, a note to pay. And now let's get back to her. If you pay attention She's not asking for approval at any point in this entire thing. You know, I always use the, I call this request for approval. Um, a combination of that Ekman would call fishing for resonance, trying to make connection, doesn't happen. She's just saying what she feels or whatever. She's just putting it out there and there's no fishing. You don't see that. When the guy does the eye contact thing in the beginning, I could see this is a guy who won't put up with a whole lot out of you in normal days. I would just about bet you if you were to meet this guy in a pub, and you give him a whole bunch of whatever, he might give it right back. I can see it in his face. And you can see it, he, he almost makes eye contact in a lock fashion at one point, like that's a hard question. And I think he's trying to protect her to some degree as well, regardless of what's going on between them. This is a person that you're spending your life with, you're both going through this thing together. That quick eye contact is almost aggressive to me when I see it. So 
I don't see anything that says lie. I don't see trying to convince you. I don't see fishing for resonance. I see none of that. I just see a person telling how they feel, show, sharing that blame. But then I do see him being, be cautious how you ask the question. And this guy does ask some pretty pointed questions at times that are painful for these people to answer. Yeah. Let, let me uh, add one more thing in there. And, and Scott, see if you concur with me on this, because you're the son of a physician. And, and, and like me, you spend a lot of time around physicians and doctors oh, yeah. and surgeons. And, and so we know the character of them. There, there is one thing that you never do with a physician, which is try and lower their status, because they will come right back at you. Okay. Oh, is it like <laughs> They will, yeah. they will show you their certificates. They're going to put on their white coat and they're going to, you know, you'd call them doctor. And, and that, well, in this particular situation, we have two physicians who are taking down their status. They are low key. This is very different from what we'd expect from a physician anywhere in the world, especially a, a, a British one. So we're definitely in an extraordinary situation here. Under stress and pressure, I would expect a physician to come back really hard at me, especially on, on something that I believe Chase has called the resume statement, which is, do you not know who you're talking to here? Do you, do you think we don't know how to look after our kids? Do you, th do you think we'd, <laughs> there's none of that. There's none of that which tells me something extraordinary uh, has happened to them that they've not planned for. Excellent. Yeah, I agree totally. Do you blame yourselves regularly? Certainly the first few days, I think the guilt uh, was, was very difficult. Um, but I think as time goes on, um, we feel stronger and we felt very supported from that point of view. Let's move on. Is there a lesson here, do you think, to, to other parents? I think that's a very difficult thing to say because if you look at it and we try to rationalise things in our head and ultimately what is done is done and we do continually look forward, but we've tried to put it into some sort of perspective for ourselves. We're in a very safe resort. If you think about the millions and millions of British families who go to the Mediterranean each year, really the chances of this happening are in the order of 100 million to one. I think, I think at worst we were naive. Um, I mean, we're very responsible parents. We love our children very much. And I don't think any parent could ever imagine or consider anything like this happening. All right. Greg, what do you got? I don't have a whole lot on this one. You can see him moving his eyes around as he's accessing. Again, there's no visual, no auditory. Visual and auditory cues are up higher. I showed you earlier when your eyes are moving around as you're recalling something. If I'm making up a story and trying to recall it, I'm probably going to have to go to something rote. My eyes are going to stay in the same place consistently. They're asking these people a very hard question. This is almost a slap in the face. Do you think there's a lesson for other parents? And you can see he's a little, a little forceful saying, look, 100 million to one. He's using data. He's using the way his brain works. He's, he's saying lots of other people have said the same thing to us. Don't attack us for this. I, I don't see him creating or pulling details from something he's rehearsed. I see him responding more naturally. And when you ask him a question, he's rattling through what he thinks is what I see. Now, am I missing something? I'll also say to you guys, you need to keep me more honest here. There's a, there's a unique thing in humans or great power that we all have called mirror neurons and we feel what other people feel and we sense what other people are going through. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. This affects me. I can guarantee you on a level that it may or may not affect the rest of you because I think about what would I feel like if I were be, if we'd been grilled over what happened to our kid, would we feel like it was an attack and how would you respond? And I, I can get pretty wound up and back in your face and I can see some containment of that in him. You can see his chin is up. That chin up and forward is not deception, guys. I mean, that's nobody sticks their chin out for you to punch if they're trying to hide it. Thank you. Yeah, let me let me jump in there because I think I think you you're right there, Greg. Uh, I would say because of the change of pace that we've seen in him, the slight change in tonality that I can hear, even with that quite pronounced Glaswegian accent, and even though the Glaswegian accent is is quite an aggressive accent in the first place. 
I think we're, I'm certainly hearing anger from him at this point. I can't quite see it in him. I can't see whether the top lip has really, because he's got this Glaswegian top lip anyway, which is pretty tight in the first place. He's pretty tight anyway. But certainly the tonality and the pacing of it and the, and, uh, the increase in sharp, direct movement in his body says to me, I think he just got made a little bit angry by that one there, provoked. Mm -hmm. I agree. Chase? Yeah, so this whole thing, uh, is there a lesson for other parents here? A little bit of a slap in the face, I agree. Uh, Jerry answers and there's no confirmation glance from Kate whatsoever. She keeps her eye contact. And so he starts saying it's a very difficult thing to see. This is the way it looks from this perspective. So he's starting to use a lot of visual information. If I'm getting him to confess later, guess how I'm going to word everything. I'm not going to talk about how everything sounds to other people. I'm going to talk about how it looks. Just as a tip there. And he, he again says, if you look at it this way, and something that I thought was strange in this statement is when he says, ultimately, what's done is done. So, of course, it could be referring to them, you know, leaving the kids alone. But it should, I think it's an unusual reference, just a little bit something, some, a good data point. And he just goes back to socializing the situation. There's millions of people. There's the chances. Lots of people do this all the time. Here's the proof that this is uh, normal behavior of some sort. And when she says, I think at best we were naive or words to that effect. When she says the word naive, there is a tiny uh, meatoclastoid muscle right here movement where she shows a tiny micro expression of fear which I think is indicative of truthful behavior because she is terrified to admit this on camera they're doctors they've probably prided themselves on their reputation they both look like Abercrombie and Fitch models uh, which it still kind of goes speaks to that reputation so I think that's most likely where that fear comes from as she's saying the word naive Excellent. Well, let me address that part where he says what's done is done, because I thought about that. That jumped out at me as well. But I think what's happening here, and this is as Greg and I have talked about uh, Kafka, and what Kafka said was every person is, ne everyone is necessarily the hero of their own imagination. Now, this isn't his imagination he's dealing with, but this is the story he's had to tell himself over and over so he can get through this, is what's done is done. There's nothing I can do about it. There's nothing anybody can do about it. It's over. We've got to move forward. So I think he's, he's running that story in his head constantly to help him get past that. So I think that's why he said that he may not have meant to, but in that little anger part that's jumping out, he's saying, in other words, well, we can't do anything about it. What's done is done. I'm trying to, so he's holding his anger in. Yeah, guys, there's also the piece, there is a certain finality to losing a child. And they don't have that yet because they don't have even now confirmation of death. There's finality to losing a child that is nothing like, I mean, I've lost best friends to accidents, friends in lots of situations, my parents, my father, my mother's still around, but there's nothing as final as a child. It changes fundamentally something in your psyche the day it happens. And I can't imagine that w when he says what's done is done. I, I think a part of that is equivocating and making himself there's a there's a personal extinction piece when you let something happen to your child and if you can't get your hands around and grasp how that works you can't come out of it that's i mean it is just i i don't know how to even explain to you that when you're going through this when we lost our kid you just have to come to a realization that it is what it is if that makes sense to you yeah. it's very different than anything i've been through before in my life yeah, there's something very big and cultural around what's done is done. It, it's, it's literally Shakespearean. So it is literally Shakespearean tragedy. Um, you know, Macbeth, if it should be done, then it should be done quickly. Of course, that's the, the murder of a king. And I don't think this is what, what right. we're talking about here. But that, that finality of what's done is done is dealing with the fatal flaw, which is what did I do? <laughs> What did I do? What did I have as part of me that has now changed my life 
forever? Well, I think in this circumstance, we're looking at who decided, well, we'll just leave them another 30 minutes. They'll be okay. That fatal flaw of it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. What could go wrong? I think that's the, the horrible drama that we're dealing with here, which, uh, you know, as, 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 as Chase rightly says, it, it, we can see it breaking them up right now. Awful, awful situation. Yeah. yeah. I totally agree. And again, I think that, go, that goes back to him coming out of his, his normal structure of uh, communication, giving that information in, those, in that almost perfectly structured. Everything from his diction to content is just, there it's all it's perfect but but that anger ramps up a little bit and that's when he jumps out of that out of the pocket of that and starts convincing trying to to convince the interviewer as well as himself again that there's nothing you can do about it what's done is done so i i agree with you on that i agree that's that that's a heavy that's a heavy statement right mm -hmm. there for um either way any way you look at it yep. so all right we good is there a lesson here, do you think, to, to other parents? I think that's a very difficult thing to say because if you look at it and we try to rationalise things in our head and ultimately what is done is done and we do continually look forward, but we've tried to put it into some sort of perspective for ourselves. We're in a very safe resort. If you think about the millions and millions of British families who go to the Mediterranean each year, Really, the chances of this happening are in the order of 100 million to one. I think, I think at worst we were naive. Um, I mean, we're very responsible parents. We love our children very much. And I don't think any parent could ever imagine or consider anything like this happening. Yeah, let's move on. Looking back, I mean, did you see anything suspicious in the days leading up to her abduction? Did you notice anything? Have you been racking your brains to try to, to think whether people might have been watching? We didn't. If we did, we wouldn't tell you because it may be important information, but we didn't, you know. It was such a relaxing holiday. And in fact, as a family unit, up until that night, and with the friends we were here, certainly for us, it was as good a holiday as we have had with the children up until that point. Okay. So, Greg, what do you think? Yeah, I think the, the giggle here, the kind of little chuckle he does, will make people immediately think guilt. But I think it's a place where he's saying, look, we're smarter than you're giving us credit for. We're not going to tell you something like that is all I hear. Now, could that be hiding something? Certainly. I mean, but at the end of the day, his body language doesn't deviate from what it has done the entire thing. Remember, we talk about baseline. He's telling a story. His story is responsive. His eye accessing cues are moving as you ask a question. His cadence is pretty consistent. He's not as emotional as his wife, clearly. And if you don't know that whole Glasgow demeanor, and if you don't know that these guys are doctors, and if you don't know that all those pieces, this starts to be context. All the things that we talk about, you got to take all this into account and look at his baseline from the beginning to the end. If you want to see a disrupted baseline, look at the night he reads a statement about the, the child. He can barely talk. But otherwise, he's pretty consistent in everything I've seen. And this is, we're using this video specifically to pay attention to what we're talking about. His, his demeanor doesn't shift throughout the entire thing. His chin is up the entire time. If he chuckles, it's we're smarter than you give us credit for. If you think we're going to tell you anything that's going to compromise the case, that's all I see. I totally agree. Most people will, will think that's duper's delight or duping delight. I don't see that at all. I've heard a couple of people say that so far. Um, I, I, I think I watched two other things as I was looking, searching through videos where people were, were saying it was duper light, And I don't, I don't, I agree with you. I don't think it's that at all. Chase, what do you got? There's no duper's delight in here. I would stake my reputation on. Same. Yeah. Um, we're, we're seeing there's Jerry's got a contemplative breath before he starts to respond. No. And we see Kate, She's doing a shoulder shrug while saying no and breaking eye contact a little bit there. And her blink rate goes from 40 to about 85, give or take, uh, as she's denying whether or not they saw something in the room, which, of course, the police would say, no matter what, don't say this on camera if you want your daughter back. So, and that's something an investigator could, could tell them. 
So her attempt and Jerry's attempt at smiling and deflecting some of the tension there with a smile, they're both, like I said, very good looking. They're, they're doctors. They know how to fake smile if they want to fake smile. And they did a horrible job here. And I think that's indicative of truth. Because if they wanted to sell something, they would have put on a, put on a show. They have no desire to put on a show because they don't give a crap anymore. There's no request for approval. There's no fishing. Everything here is just facts, just statement. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So this is one, of the, one uh, unusual instance where I would say a really poorly executed fake smile is indicative of truth. I totally agree with you. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so watch at the end when he talks about, uh, I think he says, as good a holiday as we ever had as a family. And during that, we see true sadness. Just as we've seen true shame, we see the eyebrows lift up here, down here, drooping of the eye eyelids here, lip depressors here. That's all the signals you need to go, that's somebody who is absolutely sad. That's sadness there and to have that on as good a holiday as we've ever had so it's contra gesture to the words that's kind of hard to do and so i would say it's true sadness even on the idea of a great holiday uh i i really feel the sadness for him there so so um you know just as as greg's saying there my near, mirror neurons are picking it up as well it's good enough it's good enough, it's, it's good enough real emotion that even over really bad quality of video, I, I feel the sadness. So that's usually quite indicative of a very true feeling. I agree, 100%. Looking back, I mean, did you see anything suspicious in the days leading up to her abduction? Did you notice anything? Have you been racking your brains to try to, to think whether people might have been watching? We didn't. If we did, we wouldn't tell you yeah. because it may be important information, but we didn't, you know. It was such a relaxing holiday. And in fact, as a family unit, up until that night, and with the friends we were here, certainly for us, it was as good a holiday as we have had with the children up until that point. All right, well, that's the last question. So why don't we, as we usually do, let's kind of throw it around the room and uh, wrap up and, and say what our percentage of uh, truth versus deception is. Uh, Chase, you want to go first? Sure. I think it's about uh, 90, 92.761 is what I'll <laughs> go with for this one. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so, you know, what's amazing is compared to many of the videos that, that you've seen us, you know, comment on, is we've got no resume statements here. We've got no obfuscation. We've got no distractions. We've got no, hey, look at the squirrel over there. We've got none of that going on. Uh, look, you know, lying is one of our most important social skills, as is telling the truth. So, so are they telling us absolutely accurately about everything? No, that's not going to be the case because they're telling a story, their idea to help them get their daughter back and, and you know, a whole bunch of things. So, so am I seeing about the things that matter around this? I would say we're absolutely hearing the factual truth, accurate truth about all the things that would matter most uh, around a, a young child being uh, abducted. Um, now, we also, I think, get some truth about how they feel. Very clear. Um, uh, let's go through it again. Um, guilt, shame, uh, the worst feeling, helplessness, helplessness, guilt, shame, sadness. Uh, they're very clear. They tell us all of those and they show them. So it's very honest, very truthful what we're seeing here. Yeah, I agree 100%. What I'm seeing is, is it's straight ahead, no re that they have no reason to like, I think Greg was saying, no reason to hide anything there are and Chase was saying as well. And you too, Mark, they're just saying what happened, and what they saw. We don't we're not again, like I was saying at the top, no illustrators are very minimal, no barriers, 
we're not seeing any big eyebrow movement except for a, a couple of, of medium things. You know, the eyebrow flash that Chase talked about earlier, we're not seeing anything that's indicative of, de of deception at all, except for that, that one part where they're laughing because obviously they've been told, don't mention this part, don't mention that part, a little, little thing in there. Um, and I think what we're seeing here is profound sadness and guilt. The two parents who it's about to eat them alive, you know, as they're, as they're trying to get through this, especially so soon after this has happened. And for me, I'm seeing, I'm going to count that one part as 4% deception and, and the, the 96% of being uh, truthful of being truthful. Yeah. So Jake, what do you got? Uh, this is one of those sad, sorry, go ahead, please. Jason. I think it's the first time Scott's ever been kinder than I have. <laughs> well, I might surprise you today. So, guys, this is one of those sad times that I actually am saying that people are telling the truth because you're it's a horrible situation. There's nothing good for these people. You can see they're just done. There's nothing left. If you were to ask them how they felt at that time, I'd tell you they would say empty. There's nothing left. They've cried enough. They've been angry with each other, all that kind of stuff. Now their emotions are gone. They're just there. If you notice, there's no attempt to sell. Nothing. There's not even the attempt to look ashamed for you. The shame they're showing is for them. They really do feel ashamed. They're not covering their throat because they've done something wrong. In fact, there's a couple of times he almost gets indignant that the questions that you're asking are probing into something that they've been over a million times in their life. I, a lot of people use the word congruent. This is a congruent message. My hands are moving at the same time. My voice is speaking and my head is moving. There are pieces of their body language that you would have a hard time faking. That lack of energy in this face of an interviewer who's asking you these questions would be very difficult. The fact that he's indignant in his body language but doesn't go at him is probably a good indicator. Mark, I think he would have come back and said, boom, 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 boom. I'm more qualified than you are to talk yeah. about this and this and this. And there's none of that. I think, guys, this is one of those cases, I'm going to say 90 to 95%. Somewhere in there, they're, they're hiding data that they need to hide about what happened, things that they can't share. But, and they're certainly probably protecting the fact that they've been angry with each other and that kind of stuff. That's normal. The looking around, that kind of thing is normal. Anybody, if you found evidence tomorrow that said these people killed their child, I would be absolutely astounded. Now, you can find circumstantial evidence but I would venture to say we're not going to find that based on what I see here. And if so, they need to, we need to talk to them to learn how they got so good at lying. <laughs> yes. I, t I agree with you completely. And it's this is hard, what was, hard to I fool think, all of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's good to have four of us, right? I'll, I'll show you guys something. You don't have to put it on there. I, I just realized it was happening and why I closed my thing. This is an emotional thing for me. Look at my left eyebrow compared to my right one. That's just, it's not intentional. Yeah. Yeah. I, my my dominant eye has started closing down on this yeah. on this story. It's just weird sitting there doing it. I'm not doing it in. Wow, weird. It just happened. Fascinating. Yeah, yeah that's that's that, they sound like Spock. Yeah, that's that's yeah, incredible. <laughs> you can see it. It's just yeah, done its thing. So wow, kind of incredible. All right. Well, I think this was a good one, and I think it's going to be a little controversial because of our take on it. But again. We call them like we see them. We don't, we don't lean toward anything politically. We don't lean any, toward anything uh, internationally. We don't, whatever it is, we call it like we see it. We don't care what, it doesn't matter what it is. If it looks like deception, we say, we think this is deception and here's why. If it looks truthful, we say, this looks like it's being, they're being truthful. This person's being truthful and we, we give the reasons why. So as you go through this and say, oh, you know, there's so many things that, that tell us that that's not true. I, you know, I think the four of us would be able to find something in here. We did find that one little part, but a good reason for it. But again, I would put, I would put all my chips on. These people didn't do this. All of them. And I know, I know you guys feel the same way I'm here. in this conversation. Okay. So, all right. Well, that one's in the can. Let's move on to the next one. Cool. Yeah, I'm glad yeah, we did. One. One. Yeah, yeah me one. too. Where are they, Chase? Are they out in the water? They just pulled in in the brand new party barge and then they left. I was going to show you. That. <laughs> the party barge is left without you. Funny. That's funny. <laughs> oh, man. Is that coming with the, the So after, so I just heard, um, is it?